We're ready. Are you ready? We're ready. I think we're, we're ready. Uh, welcome to Podcast Search Party. Uh, we're here to talk about podcast marketing, uh, how to grow your audience, uh, how to find your audience, and uh, have a successful podcast. Um, my name is Michael O'Connell. Uh, I work for Federal News Radio, but I'm also a podcaster. For the last five years, I've been uh, the host and one of the producers of It's All Journalism, a weekly podcast about digital media. Um, so there are a lot of things that you guys would be interested in, so certainly please check that out. Um, I also, uh, thanks to the uh, podcasting, one of the lessons you're going to learn about podcasting is it's a door opening experience. Things come to you when you put yourself out there. Um, I was at an ONA conference two years ago. I met with somebody who asked if I wanted to write a book about podcasting. So I wrote a textbook about podcasting. And because I wrote a textbook about podcasting, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be teaching a class about podcasting at American University. So none of that was on my plate five years ago. So if you, if you have an idea, podcasting or whatever, do it, because you never know what, what's out there and what possibilities there are. You just have to make the effort. So that's my, that's my go get them speech. So uh, joining us on the panel today, we've got uh, three panelists. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dan Franks. Uh, he's a co-founder and co-organizer of Podcast, Podcast Movement, uh, the world's largest conference for podcasters and podcast industry professionals. Uh, he's also the head of live events at Midroll Media. Uh, Caitlin Thompson is the U.S. Director of Content at ACAST, a, a podcast technology platform based in Stockholm, Sweden. She's worked as a development executive at WNYC in digital and media, multimedia roles at Time, The Washington Post, and in public television. Uh, she thinks the future of podcasting sounds like women and people of color, which, and I agree with her. Uh, Steel Saunders uh, is the producer and the host of Steel Wars, a podcast, and uh, Steel Wars, <laughs> I should read these things before you say them. That's your first tip about podcasting is read your copy. And a host of Steel Wars podcast, and I love Green Guide Letters podcast. Um, so, to sort of get this going, let's let's ask some uh, just some basic questions. Um, so, Caitlin, how, how do you grow your podcast? That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, um, and it's something that uh, working at a technology platform, I think a lot about, especially being a non-tech person at a technology platform and a non-sales person at a platform that monetizes and distributes podcasts. Director of content, what does that mean? I have to go out and scout shows that I think are big, and it's fairly easy to tell how, uh, if a show is big or not. Um, you know, we have some charts, although the audience numbers are not forward-facing, which is something that I'd like to get into a little bit. Um, More excitingly, I like to try to find the gems that I think are going to grow. Um, and that question is related to the question that you just asked, Michael, which is, how do I grow my show, right? Um, one of the things that I look for and I help podcasters do, although you don't really need my help to do it, um, is figuring out how to amplify the audience, obviously, that you have reached so far, and if you're a new show, you have zero audience, but chances are you have more assets than you think. Um, you have friends in the podcasting business, you have friends who might have shows or other platforms. Um, obviously, cross-promotion is something that, from my days in radio at WNYC, was a tried-and-true trick. If you get your trailer for a new show on This American Life, chances are that This American Life audience is going to find you. So what if you don't know Ira Glass, which how many of you know Ira Glass? I don't really know Ira Glass, I've met him, but uh, yeah, so not very many of us. So how else can you grow your podcast? Um, the way that we do it at Acast is we find shows that are similar in size, maybe similar in audience, but have absolutely no connection to the show. And we do what's called dynamic cross-promotion. So we ask you to make a 30-second trailer, and we pair you up with another show that might be similar in the same topic area. I'll give you an example. I have a tennis podcast. It's not great, but if you like tennis, you might like it. Um, and through this tennis podcast, I have gotten to know every other tennis podcaster. I have appeared on their shows. They have appeared on mine. And using Acast, although you can use any platform really to do this, assuming they do dynamic ad insertion, uh, we trade 
trailers for important episodes, introductory episodes that are served um, across the entire sort of vertical of sports or tennis content. Um, again, you don't have to have a platform's help to do this, but a trailer can also be used on social media. It can be used uh, to give to your friend who is making a different kind of show but might appeal in tone or sensibility. So the biggest answer is cross-promotion um, because we know that podcasting is not a zero-sum game. How many people listen to one podcast only? How many people listen to multiple podcasts? Right? So once you're hooked, you listen to more and more, which is a great thing. Um, and we find that if you're already into podcasting, we can help you discover that next user. Um, I hope we get into a little bit later uh, how you get the first podcast listener, but um, I'll stop for there because I can just talk and talk and talk well, forever. Let me, let me ask the audience a, a couple of questions. You, you already told us that you're podcast listeners. How many of you are, are doing podcasts now? Wow, that's, that's very encouraging. I, I like to see that. So you're here because you've had the experience. You, you're looking for answers as to what's going on. So you're probably familiar with some of the information that, that's come out uh, in the last couple of years about who the podcast audience is. And obviously the, the trend is growing. There are more people listening to podcasts. Certainly this room shows us there are a lot of people who are pr producing podcasts. Um, this is uh, data from uh, The Infinite Dial. Uh, they put out a report every year um, uh, where they look at uh, audio consumption and uh, they've been following, tracking podcasting for about 10 years. And it has grown every year since they started tracking it. Um, and this is what, same thing with, with monthly podcast listening. They, they, they see, it, see it going up. And you know, this shows you who's, who's listening. It tends to skew lower. I don't know if I have a slide that it tends to, sh to skew more male than female, but I think that's changing. I think there are opportunities, and, and I know that Caitlin had, had you know, in, her, in my introduction to her, she had mentioned that that was something that she, she foresaw as uh, uh, something promising about the future and the types of podcasts that we're going to be seeing. Now, this is the August uh, ratings from uh, Pod... What, it's not podcast, it's... Uh, what is it called? Um, PodTrack. Uh, they've been uh, tracking the, the top podcasts for a while. Now, if you look at this list here, you're going to notice that there are a lot of usual suspects. There are a lot of NPR shows, there are a lot of you know, Gimlet, big shows like that. Um, so it's not necessarily so surprising. And, and if you're starting, you know, I, I started my podcast five years ago with a very small audience. I've grown it gradually you know, over time. It's not, certainly it's nowhere near these numbers. And it can get really discouraging early on when you only have you know, a few hundred listeners you know, after several months of, of listening. Well, that doesn't mean that's a, that you're doing something wrong or, or that your podcast is bad. You know, maybe there are things you can do to sort of adjust what you're doing, who you're, you're I, more clearly identifying your audience and, and uh, marketing directly to them. There are always opportunities out there for you to improve. But the fact is there are a lot of, like I said, usual suspects. Um, Dan, we, we see a lot of people on this list, you know, NPR and everything, you know, how can... As a, as a podcaster, I mean, w w what's your takeaway from this? Yeah, I mean, whoa, it's a little <laughs> hot. Yeah. Uh, so when I look at this list as an independent podcaster and someone who works with a lot of independent podcasters on a regular basis, this is very intimidating, a little scary, uh, equally scary when you ask your friends or family what podcast they listen to, and usually it's Serial or This American Life, same shows you see up there. Uh, a lot of people I work with are pretty discouraged, and the second most discouraging thing is when they launch their podcast, and then 10 people listen to it, and they can probably name those 10 people. There's mom, there's dad, there's my sister, there's that guy on Facebook that liked it when I shared it. I don't know him, but he was there. So, you know, that, that's intimidating, and that's the kind of uh, thing that we're all, as independent podcasters at least, uh, faced with when we first get started. Uh, so I think what Caitlin mentioned is a very, uh, stole my thunder a little bit, I'm not going to lie, but cross-promotion is, uh, she, she talked about it, it's very important, it doesn't have to be done dynamically, that's an easy way to do it, but you can certainly just trade ad reads with people and say for this whole month we're going to be talking about each other's podcasts, uh, and I think this is something that, uh, there needs to be a little bit of a shift in the mindset from your traditional broadcast approach to things in that the last thing you want to do is send someone to someone else's station or someone else's show. 
uh, there's a little bit of a competition aspect there where I think in podcasting, a lot of the podcasters I work with initially approach it with that kind of uh, mindset, but there really is more of a colleague versus a competitor type approach that I think works a whole lot better in podcasting. Like we were saying, you hardly ever listen to one podcast, and most people don't listen to just one podcast network. They're really interested in finding new things. They want to find new things, not to abandon what they're currently listening to, but just to add things to their playlist. So I think uh, the, the first thing I would say to independent podcasters is really kind of change your approach, uh, change your mindset, and look at things from a different perspective. And Michael, I think we're going to talk about later on um, some of these uh, it, you know, it's not just about making this top 20 list. There's other end games that are oftentimes even more valuable than just having a lot of listeners. Uh, and a lot of those are the end games that are going to work best for independent podcasters. And you very well could end up, because of those things, latching onto some of these networks or teaming up with people like Acast who then have those abilities to then launch you to the next level. So I think it's, uh, there's some... Just to underscore what you just said, yeah, we don't think a lot about the top 20 podcasters because... They're great. I've worked with most of them, so have you. Um, but we really think about um, the long tail, the long game, and increasingly it's that part of the spectrum. You know, I come from public radio. I love public radio. I love the way it sounds. It's vastly over-indexed here. It's not the future of radio. It's going to be part of the future, but it's a big slice of the pie that I think will need to decrease so that we know we're reaching more than the 20-something percent of Americans who are listening to podcasts. We can get excited about that or verklempt about it, but it's going to happen either way. And so how do we prepare for that next sort of phase of more and more people getting into podcasting? That's what I'm particularly interested in. Yeah, and I put this up here to kind of scare you a little bit, to say, oh my God, I'm never going to get 100,000, 200,000, a uh, million listeners. Um, you're not, but there are, you know, as, as uh, Dan alluded to, well, okay, you're going to. Okay, it, we're going we're gonna to raise them like that? Is that how it's going to be? Uh, we're not going to tell them the truth? Um, when I did my book, I, I had the opportunity to talk to, to Rob, Libson, uh, Rob, Libson, Rob Walsh of Libsyn, which is one of the podcasting platforms. And he famously went and looked at all of the podcasts that his platform carries to see, well, how, you know, how many listeners does an average podcast get after six months? And how long does a, an average podcast last. And he came out and he wrote this, this feature that after six months, uh, a, a weekly podcast would have 145 downloads after 30 days. So that's a very small number. So when you look at these big numbers here and you think about podcasting, you're like, oh my God, I'm not achieving that. You're not alone. There are a lot of people that are not achieving that. There are a lot of those podcasts that disappear very quickly, but there are a lot of others in that middle space that are succeeding, um, that are reaching bigger audiences, that are reaching niche audiences. And that's really what kind of what, what is great about podcasting is that, you know, once you identify an audience that you have something interesting to say to, they can be incredibly loyal to you and do wonderful things for you. Um, you know, Steele, um, let's talk about your podcast. Could, could you sort of describe it and then sort of talk about what you've done to grow, grow your audience? Yeah, I, I should, first up, with, with that top 20, I don't think people should be disparaged by these giant companies being in the top 20. It, it's quite obvious. I, I think it's, like, I look at the other side and say, how amazing is it that we've got a platform where anyone, you know, in about half an hour can be on the same platform with all these giant things. Like, that wouldn't have happened... 10 years ago with, with radio or TV, like now we can actually make something that is on the same platform and it's up to the user. Of course, they've got like a brand name and advertising, but, you know, as far as like where we are on, you know, iTunes or whatever, it's, it's up to the user to find us. And I think that freedom that we're all on there together is, uh, you know, shouldn't be overlooked. But my podcasts, uh, I've got two kind of different ones that sort of specialise in fun. One of them is called I Love Green Guide Letters, which I might have to speak slower because of my Australian accent. <laughs> the Green Guide is the TV guide in the newspaper in Australia, and on the fourth page, people write in letters to complain about the TV shows. <laughs> and if you are someone that takes the time to write to the newspaper to complain about TV your complaints are going to be pretty funny. So we try to get the people on that have been complained about, like the weather person or whatever, and then they reply to the letter. And over time, you find out that it's the same 
50 uh, people with a lot of free time writing these complaints that someone's not pronouncing a word properly or Jeff wore the same tie three days in a row. Um, so there's that one. And my other one's called Steel Wars, which is sort of um, a Star Wars fan podcast and we sort of try to find the stories behind Star Wars fans and people involved like in making Star Wars uh, and how it's affected either people that are involved with it or like artists or comedians that have been inspired by it. And uh, a few of the weirder things that we've done to get people to... Uh, I always thought, you've got this medium, do what you want with it. We had this guy that used to write into the Green Guide, Arthur Comer. He was like a retiree, about two hours out of Melbourne. And he would write in every week and, you know, the listeners would say, oh, how good would it be if Arthur Comer came on the podcast? So we hired a bus and took up about 50 listeners and we had a live show with this 85-year-old retiree and uh, it turns out he had a book of all the complaints he'd ever had published in a newspaper and it's Arthur's book of complaints. Um, and then other things like just to maybe have people talking about the podcast, I used to have a live show in my apartment once a year so people could buy tickets and we'd warn everyone else in the, in the building that um, we we're going to have this live show. So we'd essentially have a live comedy show in my apartment with, like, with weirdly, you could see out the window, you could see the billboards of the people that were in the apartment recording the podcast because we managed to get, like, like super sweet guests. Um, and then on the Star Wars side, that, that's really hard to promote because there's, there's about 250 Star Wars podcasts and so we've tried to align with, um, like, when there's premieres, we'll do... In, in Australia, the premiere is at, like, midnight. So then we'll do a big live podcast with about 300 people at, like, 2.30 in the morning reacting to, like, it's, like, directly after the, th after the film. And, and that sort of gets a lot of media because it's, it's such a weird thing to have a, a comedy show at 2.30 in the morning. And uh, we also... I, I, I'm not sure how much you guys follow Star Wars. There was... In, in the new one, there was this character called Snoke, and he's a mysterious character, and in Star Wars fandom, everyone's wondering what old character he is. And I was going to a big Star Wars convention in London, and I was going to make flyers to give out to people, and hopefully they'd listen to my podcast, but then I thought, I'd, just, I'd get so depressed seeing them on the ground for three days. Because <laughs> I've, I've done comedy festivals, I know how it goes. So I decided to make something that people would want and then if they stared at long enough, they would see the name of the podcast. So I made these stickers, which sort of summed up... It was like an in-joke about Star Wars fandom. It was, your Snoke theory sucks. And that sort of summed up, like, the, the feeling, because people were sick of hearing these uh, theories. And then down the bottom, there's a tiny thing about the podcast. And what happened with this was beyond my wildest dreams, that it, in the convention, it took on wildfire that people wanted this sticker because it really hit the mark with like how they were feeling. And it ended up that the director of the next film, Ryan Johnson, tweeted out the sticker and because he thought it was like everyone that worked at Lucasfilm thought it was quite amusing. And then that got all these articles and it culminated with all these like weird famous Star Wars people tweeting it out with Andy Serkis, who plays Snoke and, you know, you know who played Gollum and stuff. He like, got given a sticker on Entertainment Tonight and was talking about how much he loved the sticker. And, yeah, it's just weird how, like, this little idea to get someone to listen to my podcast turned into this big snowballing thing on the, uh, the, the holy ground of Mary Hart. So um, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, I guess the idea is to be creative and, and try to think outside the box, to use a cliche, uh, about, you know what's going to appeal to your audience? And, you know, seeing the humour in things, don't, don't get so dire. Yeah, and it also sort of said, because there are so many Star Wars podcasts, and some of them are very serious, and my one's sort of more, I really love it, but let's make fun of it, you know, there's weird stuff in it. And so it also gave the tone of the podcast, it was sort of making fun of it, but, yeah, people are, people are sick of that box. Yeah. You've got to get out of it. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the things I, I discovered very early on is because I come from a, a journalism background and I was like, okay, I want to use applied journalism ethics. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell stories. I'm going to do, do everything right. I, I've never had any experience in, in audio uh, production, really. 
And it, it became very clear early on that, you know, part of the trick is to create audio that people want to listen to. Uh, from a technical standpoint, making sure your audio is good, that you're not hurting people's ears, that they're not going to turn you off just because they can't stand listening to you. But the other is actually, you know, what we do, especially this is a, almost a terrible thing to say in a newsroom, is a bit, a bit of a performance that you, you assume your podcast persona, and it can be you, it can be as true to you as you want it to be, it's a part of you, and, and you talk in a certain way, and you express yourself, and you, you sort of live in the moment, and these, these are the things that, that allow you to connect with your, your audience, and you want to connect with your audience because they're, they're the people who are going to tell their friends that, yeah, I heard something really funny, I heard something really amazing on, on a podcast. So. So we, we've kind of come to the point where we're just going to enter into general discussion here. Um, so, I, you know, I've got a smaller show. I've got a smaller podcast. What can I do? I mean, we, we sort of touched on a couple of things, but what are some real practical things to do? Live shows. What? Live shows. Live shows. Even if it's a tiny live show, a live show in the right context is uh, actually a really easy way to communicate both with your audience directly, get to know who is connecting with your sensibility, um, and then sort of spread the word, and you've created content in the sort of, um, in the in the making of it. Um, obviously, attending a Star Wars conference where you are both sort of there as a viewer and sort of as a value add is a good thing, but imagine, uh, what I like so much about the era of content we're in, sorry to praise content generally, because that's kind of cheesy, but what I like so much about the era of content we're in, whether it's audio or just whatever, um, it's so atomized and it's so niche that um, you know, on one end of the spectrum you have all these niche things, whether they are print magazines or podcasts or websites strictly devoted to one singular tone or one singular topic. And then on the other end of the spectrum you have the platforms distributing those atoms. And you, the listener, or the viewer, or whoever is consuming sort of a diet of those atomized things. We're no longer all coalescing around the same big sources, whether that's the same big podcast, same big websites, same big news display, right? So if I'm a podcast creator, I'm thinking, what's the most niche way to present my podcast in front of maybe a small audience, but an audience that's really going to get it and become proselytizers for it? And it's going to give me feedback about how I'm consuming, creating, and reaching people. It may be in a way that can even include them. Um, this is one of many, many examples, but a live show, even if you're small, is not a bad way to kick the tires, especially if you have a niche audience that you know you can be in front of fervent, very rabid fans um, of what you specifically are doing, right? So if I'm going to host a live tennis podcast of my tennis show, I'm going to find the people who want to talk about Serena's outfits, not the people who want to talk about her scores. And guess what? Every other tennis podcast is going to be talking about the results on the court that day, and mine is going to be the only one being like, whoa, she had the same shoes as Kobe for Black History Month. Those are fire, right? So that is who my audience is, and I want to meet them as opposed to just being in that generalized audience, even if it's smaller. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like, your audience might be too broad, right? Because if you're saying, how do I grow my audience? It might be first by shrinking it and by identifying who are the specific people that this show is for. The broader it is, it's great for those, you know, top 20, top 100 shows we had listed up there. But maybe you're not going to, you know, accomplish that necessarily right away and you need to scale down and you need to focus in. I mean, I think that's a, that's a great thing and something that any of us could technically do. We could always say, okay, this show is about X, Y, and Z, but what if we qu cut Y and X out and just focus on Z? There's some growth to be had just by simply doing that. Yeah, that, that's actually, with the Star Wars thing, there were so many, and, that, and many of them were quite dry, and I'd listen to them, but my wife, who loves Star Wars, probably wouldn't. And so I sort of, I love the Mark Maron podcast, you know, the WTF where he does these in-depth interviews. And I, so I thought, what about if I did, if I Mark Maron Star Wars and sort of did these like hour-long in-depth interviews, you know, with people, you know, musicians or whatever that have been affected by it. And then just because there were so many that were just like, here's the news of the week. And then once I got built up like uh, a listenership, then people sort of started saying, oh, can you do another show like with the news, so now we actually do another show that's a bit more traditional, but we, we actually do it on blog talk so people can call in, so it's a little bit different as well that, that there's that interaction. But the live show thing, sort of, if you do it like enough and you do, like you keep it small and stuff, it can, it sort of changed my life that 
that I saw over, I've been doing podcasts for about like five or six years and I've seen people that were sitting by themselves now meeting up for lunch beforehand and you know there's like a Facebook group and it sort of creates this little community and then if like say you're going to do like a like a, it sort of seemed like a tennis show with like attitude or whatever but you know it sounded like it was like having a bit of fun with it yes like if you advertise that that you're going to have this live event you'll get people that maybe don't listen to the podcast but just want to come to the live ex- like they'll just go I want to hear people talk about tennis. Oh like yeah, that. we do it during grand slams or big tournaments so that people can have a touch point. And we specifically don't make it feel like they have to have all this context of tennis, the sport mm. that I love and I can talk really deep about. But you don't need to do that. If you just want to talk about shoe styles, everyone can have an opinion about that. Here's a cocktail and a live podcast taping. So like again, I'm sure not everybody who listens to your show is versed in all the canon. They don't need to be. That's not necessarily who you're reaching. But you, I mean, I'm sure maybe they are. Oh, like, no, no, no. I had a guy email me and he got into the podcast through my other one and he said, oh, I really enjoy your Star Wars podcast and after listening to 74 episodes of it, I've decided to watch Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? And he goes, oh, I just like the enthusiasm of you listening to Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, and actually that's, um, that's something that I feel like it's not a tip or a trick, but I think I consult a lot with people who are starting a show or people who want a show and don't... Uh, know where to start and they think like oh let's have a conversation about microphones which platform should I use should I use mid-roll for sales blah, 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 blah. here's like the two things you actually need are you ready it's so dumb but it's really really obvious and everyone f- like doesn't think about this you have to have first of all more than anything else pragmatically the ability to execute this thing more than once if I told you the amount of shows that are brilliant that are one or two episodes long you would die of frustration like I do because you'd be like, oh, you had a great idea, but you never did more than one episode. So more important than a great idea or great guests or great microphones is literally just the ability to do show after show after show after show. Because guess what? You can get better microphones. You can find your sensibility. You can hone in on your ideal guest. You can find your ideal show length time, better transition music. But just putting it out with regularity allows your audience to sort of connect to it and and build, build up from there. The second thing... Um, is are you a good tour guide? You have to be a good tour guide, A, so you have to have a good host. It can be a celebrity host, but it doesn't have to be. It can be you if you're a really good tour guide. I'm a good tour guide for tennis because I bring a lot of people in who don't care anything about it and leave them caring slightly more. That's it. But hopefully I'm in... If they don't mind me, then they're not going to mind my show, Right. So can I be a good tour guide? What you're talking about, the enthusiasm that got this guy to listen to 74 episodes and then watch Star Wars, that's insane. Um, You need a good format. and You need need a good topic. You don't have to have all three of those things, but you have to have two, right? A host who's compelling slash a tour guide whose enthusiasm can sort of bring the audience member in. A good format and a show that I'll give you that's format perfect, actually has almost no host, but is a great topic, is Song Exploder. It's a format-driven show that explodes a song, plays different elements of how a song comes together. You hear from the producers or the composers or the singers or the band members. And at the end, in this perfect narrative journey, 15 minutes later, you hear the completed song. Maybe you like that particular artist who's on that week's episode, maybe you don't. But no matter what, the journey of that is, at the beginning, there is just ingredients, and then at the end, there's a song. It's a perfect format. It could work for a number of different topics besides music, and it has almost no host. But in general, you need a host who's great and or a topic that's great and or a format that's great. Two out of three will work. Zero out of three, you're effed. I, I just want to circle back and add something to uh, the, the live event thing. There's a podcast, and I forget the guy's name. Uh, the, the Herndon is a small suburb of uh, Washington, D.C., and there's this guy who does a weekly podcast just about living in the D.C. area, you know, commuting on, on Interstate 66 and just having fun. And he does live events, but he doesn't record them. He, he, ha- he, he has meetups with his audience. Uh, they have an annual pub crawl where they, they crawl through the, the streets of, of Herndon. And, you know, the first year he had, you know, maybe 25 people. The second year he had over 100. So in, in a very bizarre way, I mean, 
the phrase audience engagement, I think if you're a journalist, you, that's probably something you use almost every day when you're talking about how you want to get your stories. You know, podcasting, it's all about audience, audience engagement. You know, come up with a topic that's going to interest them and then, you know, entertain them, get them to come back. And, and part of that is, is who is your audience? I mean, it's okay to go out and do a podcast just because you like um, Hot Wheels cars and you want to do a Hot Wheels car podcast. That's because a good topic. That's with, because it's your, it's the, you're an expert at, you, know, you have 2,000 cars going back to the 1967. Um, I don't know why I pulled that date out of the air, but, but you can do that. But, you know, the, the funny thing about podcasts and this niche thing is once you determine what your topic is, in many ways that kind of sets what the, who your audience is. So there may only be 10 people who really, really care about that podcast. And so the trick is, is to get them to, to, to be your audience and, and to do the pod, podcast for them and yourself. But then on top of that, build it. You know, maybe there is a wider appeal. I know there are plenty of niche podcasts. There's a, there's a podcast called Swinecast. It's about hog farm raising in the United States. I think there are like 2,000 hog, farm you know, hog farmers in the U.S., and they probably all listen to this podcast. But it's like picking a topic, serving that audience, and, you know, monetizing it. And, and maybe also having a, a unique spin on the topic yeah. as well. There's a, a podcast called The Star Wars Minute, and they watch one minute of the film... <laughs> So from the start, they go through, they started at Star Wars, they watch one minute and they do 25 or so minutes breaking down that minute, right? And that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It's, it's the number one Star Wars podcast and it's like normally in the top 20 of TV and film. So it's, it's, it's that, like, like an idea that sort of seems kind of nuts, but it's for word of mouth. I like to go, did you know there's a Star Wars podcast where they analyze one minute at a time? And someone might go, oh, I want to see what they say about this minute. I love this minute. <laughs> and, yeah, it, it, it's huge. And, you know, granted, they are, like, really, you know, really funny and interesting guys. But it, it's kind of an idea that shouldn't work. And it's, it's very popular. Yeah. Again, that's format. the great thing about Perfect this. Perfect format. Yeah, it podcasting allows for a great deal of creativity. That's the other thing. Don't just do a podcast. I mean, everybody starts out imitating somebody. Everybody, you know, I imitated, imitated Mark Maron as well. Um, but you're going to find your voice and, and, and the way that you want to communicate with your audience. Um, but just because you, you imitate somebody, that doesn't mean that you're, you're locked into whatever that format is. You know, oh, I have to do an hour-long podcast because Mark Maron does an hour-long podcast. You know, you're covering City Hall, you want to do a City Hall podcast, maybe 10 minutes is all you want to do. You know, figure out what, what you can do on a regular basis, what your audience is interested in, and then, damn it, do the best you can at that. And, and people, people respond to that type of commitment. Yeah, and, and also borrowing stuff from other genres of podcasts. It's like, called stealing, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> borrowing. Borrowing. Um, <laughs> I, there's, like, with, it, it, there's this weird thing in the history of the development of, of like new formats of media is the two main industries that exploit it the best first is uh, professional wrestling and pornography. And I, I, I got both. obsessed with the way professional wrestling got covered in podcasts and stuff and a lot of their... Um, the, the, the way they sort of cover stuff and the format of shows, I sort of like, oh, you could take that, like the call-in show idea, which I got from a pro wrestling podcast, which is on Blog Talk. I was like, oh, you could do that a bit. Like, you just put that in Star Wars. And, you know, if, you, if you're sort of, like, up to dealing with the uh, not knowing what anyone's going to say at any moment, which is kind of fun, then that's a good way. But, you know, if you, like... Say you like your tennis podcast, and you were super into. I better have a lot of new tennis podcast listeners <laughs> after this panel, by the way. It's a room full this of is tennis why I'm doing podcasts. It. But like, and if you were into like basketball or something, you go, "Oh, I'm going to do a basketball podcast with that sort of attitude." Exactly. Right. I, I would say though, if you're going to do a live podcast, if you've got two like people on the panel, you have like one table at one end and one table at the other, and the audience have to look side yeah, to side. Great idea. <laughs> You want to be a guest on my podcast? Yes, it's it, it, an audio podcast, right? It's you know the audience can see it, but not. It's a live event. Never mind. <laughs> um, but uh, we're talking about um, in general. We're talking about marketing. How can we market our podcast? When do you? When should you really start thinking about marketing in your planning and the development of a podcast? Before you launch it. 
you win a prize. <laughs> That's true. No, it's, it's, it, it seems counterproductive. But, and, and there are ways for you to do it. You could, I mean, leverage the, the resources you have at, at hand. If, you have a, if you're working for a news site, you know, advertise it on your news site. If you work for a radio station, advertise it on your radio station. Take advantage of your email list. Take advantage of your, your social media. You mentioned um, wrestling. You, one of the reasons wrestling has, has taken off is they have a built-in audience that is, is rabid about wrestling and follows it religiously on social media. Those are, those are, are trumpets for getting people to that podcast. So look for those opportunities that you already have, those resources that are there. Yeah, and I would sort of, um, and then I'm sure people have some questions. I would uh, sort of um, distill that down because I have gotten in trouble before being like, oh, my tennis podcast, I'm going to just put it on my website. It's like, well, who said you could? But um, what I would okay. say is that a lot of these, you know, or I see a lot of people who sort of are like, cool, I haven't taped an episode. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I already have a Twitter handle, uh, artwork, da, 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 da. So, yes. Think about marketing beforehand. Think about leveraging the existing resources and connections you have, certainly. But also, you know, unique to each topic area or format area or whatever, there are going to be certain mechanisms that you can pull, certain levers that you can sort of leverage against, whether it's the wrestling community that's really big on Twitter, as is the tennis community. And the tennis community is super snarky on Twitter, which is the tone of my show. Other sites, not at all a good fit, so I don't go there. Instagram, you know, again, and these tie together with other cross-promotional efforts like Dan was talking about, where let's spend a month promoting your show on my show, um, or let's promote each other's Instagram accounts, or let's, you know, whatever it is. So I think, you know, thinking, sp thinking critically both about, yes, what are the sort of broad platforms, whether it's social or distributed or newsletter or digital or whatever, but also how does my community, the community that I feel like I'm already part of, that I'm going to speak to, how are they going to be able to get a hold of this thing and share it among themselves mm -hmm. and help amplify? That's like a little bit more of a critical lens that I think is worth the investment in making. Yeah, and, and something Michael touched on at the start was it's different to radio where you're not in competition or you shouldn't... I don't think the spirit of podcasting is about competition. It's more about collaboration and community, and if you're going to do a podcast, you know, say about tennis, and there's like a community of tennis podcasters, you know, follow them on Twitter and engage in them and break down that wall because there's this weird thing with humans when, you know, like just say you're doing your tennis podcast, and then you see there's another one starting up, you might be like, you know, screw those guys, whatever. But then. If they're coming at you and tweeting and going, love the new episode or responding, like if you start engaging in the community, then you sort of like build up a voice as a community, like in the community and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I'm sure you have other podcast, Star Wars podcast creators on your show on occasion, right? Those, do those oh, beams cross to, to use a different it, science fiction It's It's metaphor? sort of like, because it's like a nerd thing. It's like... It, that was know, Ghostbusters, just, just <laughs> pointing it out. Sorry. OCD, sorry. Go on. <laughs> um, nerds, and you know, podcasting is a nerd thing, you know, regardless if it's like sports or whatever, it's just people wanting to know too much about something. But, you know, like when you look at like the Avengers, like that movie, people love it because it's a team up with all their favorite things. And, and we find our most popular episodes is when we have like another Star Wars podcast or, oh my God, there's a guy from this Star Wars podcast and this Star Wars podcast are like going to be on one Star Wars podcast. Like there's, yeah, it's the, like the Jetsons meet the Flintstones crossover yeah. episode, and everyone's yeah. head explodes. You're like, whoa, you guys know the other tennis podcasters, and you're doing a mega episode. It's like, believe it. Yeah, people love that, and even in back home in Australia, I know we just had the grand final of the football, and three different AFL podcasts that are all done by different comedians had this big live show the day after, and it sold out, and it, you know, people enjoy it, and it also exposes, you know, you get you know, different uh, people that are like, okay, they're on, like, you know, hey, oh, hey, I was on this podcast, so people go listen to that, and uh, that's a great way to do it. It depends on what genre of stuff there is, but if there is already an established group of people podcasting about your topic, like, reaching out to them and, you know, be the one that, you know, drops in an email saying, oh, hey, I'm doing, you know, I love your podcast, I'm doing like this, give it a listen, maybe, I'd love to have you on, like, compliments and an invite, that will work wonders, and it, it, and, and leverage. It, it's, their, it's very few times that that they'll be like rude about it. Like I know one friend who actually 
turned out to be like an award-winning Star Wars podcaster. When he was trying to get into it, he emailed the biggest Star Wars podcast at the time and asked how to get started. And the guy wrote back and said, it's cool, man, we've got it covered. <laughs> and which is just <laughs> such a dickish thing to write back. But um, that's very rare. And, you know, you'll find that 80% of that podcasting community that you want to podcast in are going to be, you know, really open and flattered that someone listens and, and wants to wants you to be a part of their show as well. Yeah, and if you like talking about something, chances are you like talking about it with other people who like it. Let me, uh, let's, uh, I think we reached a point where here. we want to open this up to um, questions from the audience. Um, this is being streamed, so if you can go up to the microphone, that would be great. Um, Please. We're here to answer your questions. Where are you from? I'm from Austin, Texas. I work for the Texas Tribune. Cool. Um, yeah. We have a podcast. Great paper. Say again? Great paper. Thank you. They're awesome. I love them, um, obviously. Um, we have a great podcast that we love and has a decent-sized audience. Um, one thing I've learned that could be a myth, so if it's a myth, please tell me that iTunes reviews helps a lot. Having a lot of those is helpful in growing your audience. Um, how do we get more of those beyond just asking our readers, or listeners to review us on iTunes. That's such a bummer. I hate that it's that way. And I don't think it's going to be that way forever, but I'm going to no, let Dan No, but it is that way. There's a certain, and it's a, it's, a, it's a science how iTunes ranks their shows and stuff, and it's all about how much, uh, like in a short period of time, how many subscriptions you have and how many reviews and ratings you have and all of these things. But to answer your question about how to get more, um, I've seen a lot of people have success with incentivizing, and it's not necessarily like hey, we're going to give you money if you do this. But depending on the content of your show, maybe people want you to do two shows a week instead of one. And you say, when we hit 100 ratings and reviews on iTunes, we'll give you a bonus show. There's all kinds of things, and it's really all about what your audience values. And if they value more content or an additional content, or we're going to go an hour and a half this week instead of an hour. Like, there's all different things, and there's not a right or wrong answer. But I think kind of figuring out, you know, instead of just saying, oh, it helps us to do a ratings and review. That's one thing. Maybe it's a place on the website that says here's how to give ratings and reviews. I've seen a lot of podcasts that the audience isn't really technologically savvy so they figured out how to listen to a podcast but that's kind of the extent of it. Maybe there's a 30 second video on Facebook. Here's the three steps to actually give this rating and review. So there's all different types of things like that that I found that you know and it's a little bit. Little bits are going to help and it's not, not one you know one size fits all but there's, there's some creative ways to do it. Yeah, it's that's really smart. It's my understanding that the actual reviews only account for maybe 20% of your ranking. And it's, it's the iTunes thing, it's what have you done for me lately? <laughs> uh, like, definitely. You're but talking about Apple. They, they wouldn't be like that. The, I have found with getting the reviews is letting your listener know how important their voice is and how much you'd enjoy to hear their review and how much, like, they count to helping you out. Like, sometimes... People just listen to the podcast and just for the fact that they're listening to you, they think that you're like super popular and have this massive listener base. But you sort of have to empower them, I think, to say, oh, you're like, like this is an open slather medium and you have the chance to bump us up and vouch to other people like you that we're doing good stuff. And I, I think giving your audience, like letting them know that their review counts and, and you read it, I think that might inspire them. But I've found if you get more than, you know, like, if you get more than 5% of your listeners to write a review, you're doing very well. It's, it's crazy and sometimes a little bit um, of a bummer how few people, of the thousands and tens of thousands of downloads, how many people actually, like, go to do that. But, I would put but, an asterisk next to your question and say, wait, these are both really, really great ideas that you probably should do anyway in some way to, to engage your audience to do something. Um, before you create a whole campaign to give iTunes ratings and reviews, wait to see what iTunes is going to do when they release all of their metrics or claim that they're going to release all their metrics because most of it is BS in a way that incentivizes what have you done for me lately. It's The algorithm is theoretically based on momentum, which means if you get five reviews within an hour, it counts more than five reviews spread across two weeks. Um, so the hope among a lot of us in the podcasting community is that this sort of transparency will actually 
um, lessen the way that people are gaming the system and actually be more, uh, like engaging with your audience is what you should be doing anyway. So think of it that way. And then tactically, I think we need to know a little bit more theoretically in December, we will, from iTunes about how they actually make up the ratings. What I'm hoping for is totally transparent listener numbers that are IAB certified because that would help the entire industry and hopefully that's what we'll get. And your question and where you're from? Hi, I'm Ava Thompson Greenwell. I am a journalism professor at Northwestern University at Medill. And about 70 to 80 percent of our classes are female. And I know you mentioned earlier that there seems to be a wide open space for podcasting, but I don't hear them demanding courses in that or even asking questions about that. So I wonder, um, besides the institutional racism and sexism that's already out there, are there any particular barriers to entry for that particular group? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, everything from innate gender uh, proclivities that would have, you know, dudes raising hands or shouting and women politely raising hands and deciding to be demure and not ask a question. You know, I mean, there's systemic stuff at every, at every you know, I don't need to tell you and you don't need to tell me. We both know. Um, what I think is wonderful about podcasting and where it came from, where it di diverges greatly from radio and how I think you could address this from an academic perspective, I'm guessing, in terms of coursework, um, is uh, having gone to Missouri Journalism School, sorry, um, mutual fans, uh, we didn't have a choice about being in the broadcast sequence or the magazine sequence or the newspaper sequence. It was a requirement that we had that experience. I would consider making some kind of broadcast experience mandatory for every single journalist in the school, which will ca cap capture the females, um, and giving people the sort of, con I, I, I see it as a confidence deficit, especially in podcasting, because you have still certainly present, but fewer systemic roadblocks to getting content out there now that cop content is theoretically able to be created by anybody anywhere with any sort of expense of microphone setup. It's pretty minimal. But, you know, the barriers really are, I think, at this point, instead of having to go through a news director who you have to convince to let you to tell a story or convince is a story even, or a program director telling you that they don't think that audience is valuable or out there or will care, now you have a chance to prove it. But So where's the deficit? I have to imagine it's a confidence and enthusiasm deficit, so address it by making it mandatory. I mean, you've seen those studies yeah. that, that students have where you know, everyone gets mandatorily has to participate in class instead of waiting for people to self-select. Um, you know, self Dudes self-select, females don't. So knowing that, how can we rejigger it? I would say apply it to, to the broadcast content and get people comfortable with, with um, you know, and then literally light on fire anybody who talks about vocal fry or what it sounds like to um, you know, hear a woman speak because they got no place in this conversation as far as I'm concerned. And, and as, about speaking to other groups, there's a podcaster up in Baltimore named Jay Jackson Rao who does the Nerdpocalypse podcast, uh, um, uh, pop culture from an African-American perspective. He found his audience. He, he creates content for his audience. He's got like five different shows now and is monetizing a network uh, built around that. So there's a lot of, in podcasting, you can do it yourself. And, and you definitely should push as much as you can uh, wherever you're at. Question? Yeah, hi, I'm John Schwabish from the Urban Institute, which is a nonprofit. Uh, downtown DC. Uh, I want to ask about the tech behind the live shows. So when you do a live show, if you're doing an interview, do you use your standard mic setup? And if you're doing that, like how, and you're doing an interview or you're doing your standard tennis podcast, how are you engaging the audience so that when someone listens to the episode on their commute the next week, they get that sense that it's a live show and it's, and it's different? There's an art to it. It's, it's a totally different type of podcast. And I came from doing stand-up comedy, so I was sort of you know, used to hosting shows. Uh, as far as the tech, the e easiest way I think to do it is the, the Zoom H6 uh, because it's got a little nodule on the top that you can record on a separate track the actual ambient room mm -hmm. and you can sync it up perfectly and then just work out the volume. Normally it's a bit of a lower volume so you still get those audience reactions but then you run one of the cables uh, through the mixing desk and then so you've got like the PA and then you've got a separate... Recording. I used to have, before that Zoom H6, I had that. I used to set up two and have to like sync them in yeah. audition. And that was like three hours an episode. I'd never, because I'd always be like, uh, 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 and it was never get it lined up properly. Um, you have to go into the live podcast just a slightly 
a bit different and willing to engage the audience a bit more. Like for the Star Wars ones, I have like a, a Q and A like this towards the end, and it also helps people like meet other people, come out of the shell when they ask questions, they introduce themselves, stuff like that. Um, and and you know, before the the other the Green Guide one, I normally do like a just stand up just to warm up the crowd and stuff. But it's a a really different dynamic that it, it's it's quite brilliant when you um, you sort of learn to like ride that wave of audience participation. Well, and there's a few live shows I really like that have recurring segments that only take place at the live version of the show, and it becomes like a tradition. So people know that at the end of the show, maybe it's not Q&A, but it's some sing-along or some game they always play, and then the audience will look forward to the live events because that's something, the live podcast, that's something that they'll get to hear and then get to participate in when they finally get to go to a show. So it kind of creates a, a, cool, a cool kids club around the live events. Okay. I, I know. I'm very excited for the sing-along at the end of this panel. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. We're going to sit practice. practice. Let's, yeah. get these, let's get these three questions. Um, where are you from? I'm from northern Michigan, pretty rural area. It's cold um, up there. Yeah, it's, it's very cold. Um, <laughs> so we launched an interview show that's kind of like local news, and then we've grown it to about three other shows We've got a small following, but I think one of the hurdles I have is that being in a rural area with not a lot of tech, uh, people go, what is podcast? Kind of thing. So I guess my question is two part. One is like kind of, what would be kind of a way to help plan out maybe a live taping live show? And then also maybe tie in teaching people about actual podcasting, like how to subscribe and how to do those kind of things. Because I think that's my biggest hurdle is that I'm sure that the content we're doing is like stuff that they're interested in because the radio shows around us also suck. So I figure good <laughs> podcasts, they can get it whenever they sign up. So, Yeah, I, I try to find gathering places where, 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 or, or things that people are interested in where you can, where you can do a meetup. You know, I, I mentioned that guy who, who does the meetup at bars. Maybe start that way to try to generate some word of mouth at the very beginning. And I would say... Um, but these guys are probably a little bit more, um, you know, obviously with Podcast Movement, the festival, which has a lot of live tapings. Obviously, you guys do a ton of live shows. But I would say your real ch challenge here is not necessarily the tech. I would think about it a different way. The tech can sort of accommodate whatever. Maybe it's a music venue that already has a malt box that somebody can plug in and be recording, and they know how to do mic stand-ups. Certainly, there's music venues where, you know, however rural, you know, places are, or some sort of performance space. So I think the setup is less the question, and just more like, how do you involve people, and how do you teach them about it? Yeah. Hopefully, and this will change month by month, year by year, the tech will make things more discoverable. So, like, learning how to subscribe to a podcast won't involve, like, an eight-step manual for anybody who's not, like, already incentivized to do it, yeah. which sucks, and we all agree. Um, but setting that aside, even just telling, getting people excited about the community vibe of it, making the sensibility different than the local radio shows that suck, and getting them, every single person in that room should leave wanting to share the idea, have a better sense of what it is. And they're definitely going to listen to it because they were there, and they want to relive the moment, and they're going to share it with somebody else who wasn't. So, like, I kind of think, like, just do it and get the conversation part right, worrying less about the tech and the specs as long as you can get something serviceable. But start. Just don't let that kind of stuff be the barrier because I've seen a lot of people, like I said, who either don't have more than one show in them or like let kind of stuff like that be the barrier for them to actually do it. Well, we don't have a great live setup or we don't have a great music venue. It's like, yeah, you do. You have something that will work. You know, I once saw a great interview uh, tape of the Long Perform podcast with Terrence Wright in a rainstorm with like t wires in the back of a barbecue restaurant held together with duct tape and like nearly getting electrocuted. So like... It sounded great, and I was happy to be there. So, like, the conversation is what carried that day, and I listened to it later, even though I was already there. Go for that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, off, off the top of my head, I would suggest maybe doing a live event in conjunction with, like, something going on in the community, like if there's, a, like, a fair or where there's people already yeah. gathered, and you have, like, that as a special, you know, come in and watch the taping of a podcast. Uh, that sort of, like, to, you know, if you want to build up awareness of, of the show is to have things where people in the community are already going to, and then, because that's what we do with the Star Wars thing, you know, there's a convention on in Orlando, we'll go there, and, and so, like, you could use that same thing with your, you know, if there's a fair or a, a football game or, or whatever, whatever gets people going somewhere in your town, you know, try to piggyback on that and, you know, trick people into getting into podcasting through the live event. Last two questions, where are you from? Uh, hi, my name's Hadley. I live in San Francisco. I'm from AJ+, which is the digital social side of Al Jazeera. Um, 
I'm wondering, you know, discoverability seems to be such uh, a problem in, in podcasting, and social media doesn't seem really optimized for sharing audio. Um, have you seen anybody doing really interesting things in terms of sharing on social media, like pl places like Facebook and Twitter, or have you seen um, any emerging platforms for how to, sh how to share new podcasts with each other in an easier way that I, are picking up any steam? I think one of the things you have to remember is you, you want to go after podcast listeners first. You, you don't want to be converting people. I mean, certainly if, there, there's, if you've got a, a podcast, a, a topic that you think a lot of people will be interested in, you know, definitely try to reach out to those people. But if they're all people who don't routinely listen to podcasts, um, then, then you shouldn't be trying to market to them. You should try to market, figure out who your audience you really want to talk to is. And then also just look for you know, other podcasters who are in the same sort of space that you are. You know, maybe you can be a guest on their podcast or you can be a guest on, or they can be a guest on yours. And, and you leverage their audience as well. Um, Meetup groups or like uh, Facebook groups, things like that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna step on toes just for a second because we only have four minutes left, and I, yeah. there's like four of them. Anchor, um, we do one. Uh, Twitter is a much better sharing me mechanism, I guess. Fundamentally, I disagree a little bit with the notion that you only have to re reach out to existing podcast listeners because I think they're mostly white dudes in their 50s who are listening to like public radio shows or marketing shows for the most part. I'm gr generalizing greatly, obviously. Um, but I actually think Twitter is a great way to get people listening to podcasts who have never listened before. And it's actually very easy. Spreaker makes a very nice short form cutter, as does Audio Search FM, which is a startup created by two queer women in Berkeley, which is awesome. Um, Acast has a player that you can share moments. Um, I think Megaphone's platform will increasingly be supported on social. I'm focusing on Twitter largely because that's where people who are a little bit more inclined to sample short form audio are existing. Um, and because Facebook shows al al almost no interest in developing audio as a supported platform. Um, but also if you look at what WNYC did with um, HTML5 hacks for videos on Instagram or Facebook, they were able to get audio content into platforms that traditionally ser uh, serves video by, by sort of serving them as video. So if I were you guys, and I've spoken to you guys before about this actually, um, I would look into Spreaker, Anchor, Acast, Panoply, there's like a bunch, and go fishing where there are fish, and I would say there are more fish in the world of people who don't already listen to podcasts than the ones who do. But, you know, don't, you know, leave no stone unturned and all that stuff. And our final question of the day. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm from St. Petersburg, Florida. And I'm thinking about independent podcasters who may not have the inherent marketing backing of, say, a newsroom or something like that. Um, and the stats are trouble, because as we've been talking about, they're not really front facing. I can see my stats, but they don't mean anything to a lot of other people. But for the networks who may be looking for new podcasts to pick up, you know, how do, how do networks find the podcasts that fit with them with this cloud of mystery around a lot of the stats and performance information? I don't think a lot of it is stat driven. Like you've talked about content, content, content multiple times um, with, at, at the mid roll, the, the network that I'm, uh, I, I work for. Um, I'm not on the content side, but I see us picking up shows routinely that either are just conceptual uh, but they show that stick to itiveness and that ability to repeat that 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 format, um, or shows that are going that are small. But we feel like if we strap our rocket ship to it, that it's got potential. So I don't think necessarily if you're pitching your show to a network or or you know whatever that platform might be, that they're going to say show us your stats and that's going to be the yes or no. It's very much going to be like a business pitch. Here's my format. Here's my concept. Here's what I think is going to be really great about it and different and set us apart. And with your help, we can do this together. That's that's 100% the approach, I think, and stats, you know, yeah, are kind I of secondary. I've, I've got two different podcasts. They're on two different podcast networks. One, the comedy one, the network I'm with, they wanted to know just how many numbers. They wanted to know what they could sell. They wanted to know advertising. The Star Wars one, they were just like, like the podcast, and they said, we can help out. So I guess the answer to that one is there's no defined. It, it's, it's the what that network is, you know, what their uh, attitude is. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, the, the Star Wars one, they, were, they, they had, like, really popular podcasts and they were sort of just like, oh, let's, we like this one, let's help these guys. But then the other one was more just like, how do we sell this to a car company? Sort of thing. Go ahead. And the, the last thing I'll say is, uh, if, it's, if we're talking about non-podcast networks, so if we're talking about websites or, or you know, uh, 
places that maybe they don't have podcasts and you're pitching that first podcast, maybe they really, really, really want to get in the podcast game, but they really, really, really don't have the resources to do it themselves. And you could be that knight in shining armor coming in that's providing them something that they kind of want to do or they've always wanted to do, but they just haven't been able to do it themselves. You could be, you know, providing that service to them. So thinking outside the box and not just looking where the other podcasts are, but kind of paving your own way. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This is how you monetize a panel. I have um, some handouts if anybody's interested in um, ordering my book. Um, they, they can do that. But thank you very much for, uh, for coming in and listening to this podcast. <laughs>